Hello, everyone. My name is Ole Kagan. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with LA County Library, and I welcome you to Introduction to Screenwriting, Developing Your Story for Stage or Screen. I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Felice Picano is the author of more than 30 books of poetry, stories, novels, novellas, memoirs, nonfiction. His work was translated into 17 languages. Several title, titles were national and international bestsellers, and four of his plays have been produced, several of them multiple times. Picano's first novel was finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award in 1975. Since then, he's been shortlisted and received awards for poetry, drama, short stories, novels in the UK, US, France, and Germany. A former adjunct professor of literature at Antioch University, LA, Picano founded the writing workshops at the West Hollywood branch of LA County Library. He lectures internationally on vintage Hollywood, script writing, GLBT literature, and his most recent books are the Victorian era duology, Pursuit and Pursued, and the sci-fi trilogy, City on a Star. And I bring to you today, welcome to the stage, Felice Picano. The stage Thank is you. yours, sir. So, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Okay, here we go. So um, people say to me, well, you're a poet, you're a novelist, you're a story writer, a memoirist. How'd you get involved in this screenwriting business? And um, I did get involved in it quite early on um, in my writing career in 1977. And the way that happened was that uh, my second novel, Eyes, was a New York Times bestselling novel and was really pretty popular. And um, as a result, we got, uh, my agent got um, queries about optioning it to make it into a film or into a film for TV. Um, and the person that we chose was um, Cary Grant, the actor, the great actor. He and his wife, Diane, had a company called Brute Productions. And um, I flew out to LA. I was living in New York at the time and started having some meetings with these people. Um, besides Carrie, it was uh, a variety of five or six people around the table. We all discussed various things. They all knew the book and they said, this is wonderful. Come back in a few days with a scenario for us to look at. Now, I had no idea what a scenario was having never written a film before. However, I did have a um, outline for my book that I'd been using and that I had showed to my agent and even to my editor during the course of the writing. And so I looked at it very carefully and from my suite in the Beverly Hills Hotel on a, a pale blue typewriter that I, I think that Kim Novak last used to write thank you cards, um, I started writing, adapting this to the screen in the way I would figure it out, what I thought. So I brought it in and two days later and a couple of days later, everybody had read it. They called me in, they said, oh, here's some ideas, here's some notes, and why don't you go and write the first act of your screenplay? Now I was in real trouble because I'd never seen a screenplay in my life. This was 1977. It was not 2022 where you can walk into any bookstore and buy a collection of screenplays by various people, uh, the screenplays of uh, Alfred Hitchcock's movies uh, of The Godfather, of whatever movies are available. This was a closed industry as far as I knew. So what I did was I said, okay, that sounds great. And as I was walking out, I swiped a, a screenplay that was sitting on one of the tables. <clears throat> I went back to my hotel room and I inspected that screenplay from head to toe for a very, very long time before I started typing fade in. I do not recommend that you do anything like this. It is a terrifying moment <laughs> at best when you do not know what you're doing and a whole bunch of people are depending upon you. But as a result of that, I really did get to know screenplays. I wrote that screenplay and then several years later, many, several of us, and I did them in a different manner. So here's your introduction to screenwriting 
the way I thought about it over the years and inspected it, analyzed it, used my own experiences. And if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, um, please get back to us um, afterwards during the Q&A. So here's me, the basic tools. So these are the basic tools you will need. If you have a pen or pencil, or if you can copy this down, write them down. The first thing that you need is a log line one pager. You have probably never heard of that before in your life. So make sure you copy it exactly. The other thing you will need will be a one to two page summary of the main characters and subjects of your story. Now this can be an original story. It can be um, a novel or short story that you've written that you're adapting a play that you or somebody else has written and you're adapting. It could even be war and peace that you're adapting. You need a one to two page summary of the main characters and subjects of the story. And then eventually you will need a full script between 90 to 120 pages long formatted correctly. And we'll get, it, we'll get to that and all the details of all three of these in a few minutes. What is a log line? It is a brief but full summary in one page or less. It gives the title, the genre and other information. If important, it gives the setting, several characters and briefly the story or action. So we're beginning with a brief summary. So you're gonna be able to try to do this in a couple of sentences. Also the title, the genre, and we'll discuss this in a few minutes. And if important, the setting, characters, and briefly, the action. Here is a log line, a typical log line. As you can see, it's pretty short. It has the title, Casting the Runes, the genre, and in this case, it's a historical sci-fi horror screenplay based on a classic short story by M.R. James. This tells the person who's reading it several things. By saying it's historical, it means that there are going to be sets and costumes involved. By saying that it's sci-fi and horror, it suggests that there are going to be uh, CGI or they're going to be special effects, FX. By saying the screenplay is an adaptation of a short story, classic short story by M.R. James, it says that the short story is already in the public domain and whoever is going to look at this does not have to pay extra for it. And that either that or in this, ca in this case, it's a classic story. But in some cases, it might be a screenplay adaptation of a uh, story that's currently in print, in which case you have to have the rights to that story to turn into a screenplay. Now in the log line, it's giving more information. In a picturesque 19th century New England town, so we're specifying the historical, two brothers and their friends, including reclusive American poet, Emily Dickinson, and a powerful demonologist who controls and kills using the spells of an ancient Icelandic runes. So here we have the basic story and several of the characters. We know now the setting is 19th century England, not 14th century India, not 13th century Italy. We know who some of the people are in the 19th century. And we know how several of the important characters, Emily Dickinson and this demonologist, they're gonna be important later on. And this also gives the person who's reading the script an idea of what kind of actors they can get or even specific actors they can get to play Emily Dickinson and this demonology. So we have a heroine and a villain. Some examples of genre. Genre is all important. If you keep in mind the idea that um, every studio and currently television studio and currently streaming service has genres 
and that they have a, what's called a slate of films or episodes or TV shows, and they fall into different genres. A slate means that a particular company like HBO or like Disney has a variety of things that they are going to specialize in. So I'm gonna give you some idea of some of the more popular genres <clears throat> that you'll be writing in and that are going very strongly these days. Science fiction, of course, is one of them. There are a lot of sci-fi shows on the air. So detective and mystery, of course, very popular. Film noir or the American version or the current version of film noir. More genres, the love story. In this case, we have Maurice that I'm showing here. Um, the Forster novel turned into a movie. Action adventure. We know what, all of us know what that is. <clears throat> a thriller, a historical, a horror. And right now we have a, 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 um, a card. This is an actual old 1930s um, uh, theater card, it was called, for Lon Chaney in London After Midnight by Metro Goldwyn Mayer, a uh, film of the 1933, which is a thriller, it's historical, and also a horror movie. So you can have a combination if you can make it work. Another combination is the traveling angel, right? The do-gooder who comes along or the fish out of water, or you can put them together. So here's a classic film, Sidney Poitier's Lilies of the Field. He's a con man, but also a construction guy, plumber, uh, all around handyman. He's in the West in the early 20th century, and he finds himself confronted by a group of nuns who have the wherewithal to build a convent in the middle of nowhere in the desert. <clears throat> and so he cons himself into working with them. He's clearly a fish out of water, but he also becomes the traveling angel for them. Even more genres, the rom-com or romantic comedy, the screwball comedy, a lot of those in the 70s and also in the 1930s and 40s. What is in a log line in terms of the characters? So let's look at this a little more closely. We looked at it before. In a picture, two brothers. So we have two male roles and their friends, including the reclusive American poet, Emily Dickinson. And here's a wonderful photo of her. Battle a powerful demonologist, our villain, who controls and kills using the spells of an ancient Island, Icelandic runes. This is very important because everybody has to know what this story is, everyone who's involved in it, and who the main characters are. Your two main characters, and your main characters um, can be more than two. They can be th three or four. Uh, if you're doing a series like The Crown or like um, um, well, any other series that's currently going on, you're gonna have five or six, maybe 10 main characters, but they will fall into uh, various categories and they should always really be doing something like this. Um, the central character always be heading towards something or away from something. Keep that in mind. Either they have something they wanna go for an idea, an ambition. Um, they want to win the, he wants to win the race. She wants to get the guy. He wants to avoid the woman who's been following him. These are all basic things that are in virtually every film you'll see. It. And they, you have to decide whether they're going to win or lose. Again, your story or characters going back to the log line, two brothers and their friends battle a powerful demonologist. So you get an idea of who this guy is. Basic plotting. The central character wins or the central character loses. And in this scene from Carol, we have a scene where the central character 
Carol and the woman that she's meeting for the first time make their first meeting. And this is something that's gonna happen within the first 15 to 20 minutes of the movie. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but you will see very clearly within 15 minutes, whether that person is heading toward a fall or heading toward a win. And then the rest of the movie is moving you toward one way or the other. There'll be a lot of ups and downs um, before we get to that. Plotting, and these are types of plotting. The central character sows the seeds of his, in some cases, her own destruction. Bonnie and Clyde, where they begin by robbing banks, you know it's gonna end badly. And it does end badly. Moby Dick, Captain Ahab goes after the white whale. He gets everybody on his ship involved in it. You know it's gonna end badly. And it does end badly. In Giant, we have three main characters played here by Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, and James Dean in one of his great roles. And one of those characters is gonna win. And one of those characters is gonna sow the seed of his own destruction. Which one will it be? Another type of plot is the central character learn the Wizard of Oz, of course, she learns what the red shoes can do. In Black Panther, our hero learns that it's not enough to be a great hero. He has to consider people that he has never thought of before. More character plotting. The central character does the right thing. <clears throat> Here we have my best friend's wedding, where two young women are vying for the attention of a young man. We're rooting for one of them. Is she gonna get the guy or is she gonna do the right thing? In Groundhog Day, we have Bill Murray who wakes up every day at the same time and relives the same scene over and over until he gets it right and does the right thing. Plotting, the central character grows up. And here you have a lot of room development. There are a great many films that uh, show growing up. Two good classic ones are Moonlight, a recent film in which you literally have a boy growing up into a young man and then becoming a man. You also have the son in The Godfather who takes over the role of The Godfather. You also have a romantic comedy with music, La La Land, in which the two characters look for love, try to get involved in love, but eventually grow up and out of love. So those are some of the genres. Genres of our, are of all importance in um, the film and TV industry um, because people wanna know, what are you writing? What are you writing? What are you acting in? What are you directing? What are you producing? And they can, you know, anybody can say, an actor or actress can say, I'm in a romantic comedy, it's historical, and there is some thriller moments to it. So whatever. Okay, so your basic tools, now we're moving into number two. We've moved out of number one, which is the basic log line, right? And now we're into a one or two page summary of the main characters, subjects, and the actions of the story. It should reveal more or less a three act, eight part structure. Structuring for your, th for your story, the backstory. There's always gotta be a backstory unless you begin in limbo at the beginning of the universe and the Big Bang. So the backstory is an event or a series of events that happen before the story unfolds. It may haunt your main character, leading to a character flaw. This is a fun um, excerpt by Cary Grant and <laughs> the man who turned out to be his lover for life, in which there was uh, events that turned into um, something that had to be dealt with in the course of the movie. Structuring your story, the catalyst. So number one, you had the backstory. Number two, you have the catalyst. 
So even though there is a backstory, your, your story opens up balanced. It could go one way or it could go the other way. Within the first 10 to 15 minutes, the catalyst first upsets that balance, giving the central character a problem, a goal, or a mission. If this does not happen, there is no film. It is the upset of the balance of the beginning of the movie that makes the action begin to happen. Number three is the big event. It is an event that changes your character's life in a big way. It comes, as you'll see here, around page 20 or 30 of your script. In this case, um, it's a, a different Sherlock Holmes that's been done recently. And in this case, it's the destruction of the Eiffel Tower, which is a pretty big event, but it could be a personal event in which someone receives a letter that changes their life, for example. And it comes at this point because it is after the unbalance of the catalyst. So this is the third thing. The fourth thing is as the action is moving along, the midpoint or the pinch, and this is number four, this is halfway through the script, and it is another major plot twist. I said to myself when I first figured this out, does this happen in every movie I've ever seen? And I went and I went into movies, I went on TV and I watched movies and I kept my watch and from 55 to 65 minutes in, this always happened. So halfway through the script is another major twist and it's between 55 and 60 minutes inside. It is often a point of no return or the moment where he or she becomes totally committed. We're seeing a scene from Rebel Without a Cause, the great 50s movie. Here's James Dean and Sal Mineo. Sal Mineo plays Plato, Plato, the guy, the nerd guy who everybody hates. And at one point, the new guy in school, the cool guy, says he's okay. And he does it by kissing him on the cheek. This was not even in the script. It was, he was supposed to show some good thing to, to uh, to present this idea that Plato was his friend. And the uh, director, Nicholas, said when he did this, it was perfect. Structuring the crisis. <clears throat> the crisis is something, it's number five. This event forces a crucial event to occur. Often it is simply a low point or when everything looks lost, when the lovers are separated, it is the down point. Next is the showdown or the climax. This is when the central character and the opposition square off. It, it, often in action films, it is the final fight or battle. It can be a 10 minute long chase sequence. It often is, we have seen here from the 300, it is where this battle that has been prepared for the second half of the film actually takes place and people win or lose. Next in structuring is the realization. It is during or just after the showdown. Sometimes it happens right in the middle of the final battle, the final chase scene, where the audience realizes that the central character has grown, has changed, or figured something out. Now, this is very important, this line, because what films have in common with novels and often with stage plays, but not always, is that the central character has to grow, change, or figure something out. And here we have the final scene or the final minutes of uh, Titanic, where uh, the woman who had been adored at, and saved uh, from the sinking of the Titanic realizes that what she has to do is sacrifice the jewel. And then we have the final moments of your um, script after the realization of the or the last piece of action 
um, win or lose, this is the last scene that you are left with. And it's very important. This is from uh, a wonderful movie, which you haven't seen, go see. It's called The Star Man. Um, it was done uh, by uh, John Carpenter, uh, who mostly makes horror movies. And it's the very last minutes of the movie where the star man leaves uh, Earth and gives a gift to the woman who has been so good to him. So that is your eight point screenplay. It grows out of the three acts of the stage plays that uh, predominated in Europe and the United States in the 1900s and in the early part of the 20th century. Before that, there were five acts. If you go to Marlowe or Lope de Vega or Cervantes plays or Shakespeare, those are five acts. By the 19th century, they were in three acts. Um, and the um, American screenplay is a derivation of that um, three act screenplay. So now a full script is between 90 to 100 pages long, formatted correctly. And they can be longer, it can be shorter. But the reason for that is that when you start looking at the screenplay, it actually means that a 90 page screenplay is 90 minutes of screen time. So let's look at what a screenplay looks like. How does it tell everyone? on the set, what to do. Because that's, that's what a screenplay actually does. Everybody on set has a copy of that screenplay. In many cases, it'll be um, underlined for the actor or the actress or for the script person or for the sound person when they have to do something or if there's a special effect. Fade in, everything begins fade in. Interior, a West Hollywood apartment, night rain. So this immediately says where you are, an interior, not an exterior. It says it's an apartment and you're inside it. It is at night. So that shows what the lighting is gonna be inside and out. There is rain falling. That means that there's gonna be rain falling if you're looking outside and you have to hear that rain falling. So the sound people have to do that. So there's a whole pile of instructions there. Next, a small modest living room. This is important as we'll discover later on. Two windows prominent behind the sofa. So we have a sofa, we're looking straight on at a sofa, two windows. In back of them, we have night and rain. On the sofa, Lynn Barrett, Laborde sits, she's the main character. She sits, reads, marks, and takes notes from something. So we have more information there. Above the sound of the rain, we hear three sharp knocks on the window. Sound person has to develop the rain and interfere it or cover it over with three sharp knocks. Lynn jumps, that's action, startled out of a reading. Lynn leans over, more action, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get to Byron, who's looking in the window and who says, Janice, Janice isn't here, she says. Byron says, I'm hurt, some characters are after me. So we have a second character, Byron. Lynn looks outside, we hear another voice belonging to a thug. Thud, third character. You see anyone? Guy tried to jack my car. Lynn then moves over to the back door, holds up her cell phone, cell phone says to the thug, you're trespassing. Do I hit 911? Do I call the police? She taps the button on the cellular phone. It rings, is answered. That's more for the sound people to do. On the VOA voiceover, we hear another character saying, police emergency number, can I help you? A beat means we have a second, then she says, I said police emergency number. Okay. So this is the way a screenplay works. <clears throat> there are many other ways that a screenplay can work. And there are many ways that a screenplay cannot work. So let's, I wanna go back and take a look at something here.
I want to look at more characters that we had. I want to introduce another character that's very important among our two main characters, the antagonist who is determined to stop or hinder the central character. <clears throat> My finger pushed the forward button too far. Um, he or she is consciously or subconsciously against the central character or the central character's goal. <clears throat> So keep that in mind. Now I'm gonna move us down here a little bit further. And look at the screenplay again. So here we have the whole thing. Lynn, so Lynn jumps startled at her for reading. Lynn leans over and clears Miss from the window to look out. Sorry, Felice. Um, if you want to make the that slide big, go ahead and click a from current slide over at the top. Yeah, but I want to. I, I don't want to. I oh, wanna, you want to? Yeah, I want to be able to utilize it. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Um, Lynn leans over and clears Miss from the window to look out. A leather jacketed lower arm taps the window again, so we have to see that it belongs to Byron Scotty. Lynn withdraws from the window, then opens it an inch. So we have action, we have sound, we have things happening up. And then Byron, we have his dialogue. Janice, it's Byron, open up. Then Lynn says, Janice is in Vancouver on business. So we know that Lynn is not Janice. We did not know who she was before. And then we start going into the, 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 the split. So we began it, as I said, on the eight part thing with this woman sitting there, rain, everything's very quiet. All of a sudden there's a knock on the window and that upsets the balance and sets it in motion. This guy, Byron then says, I'm hurt, some characters are after me. She seems to know who she is, who he is, even though she is not the one being addressed. Then a thug appears, so we have a third piece of action taking place here, another complication. Lynn says, you're trespassing to the thug, gets, him, gets rid of him. And so the action has started moving very quickly within two minutes. These two pages represent approximately two minutes of a screenplay. Okay. <clears throat> so how can this be true? A lot of times uh, there are screenplays that are a bunch of action and then a bunch of dialogue and then a bunch of action and then a bunch of dialogue. If you remember a film like Blade Runner, the original one, there's all this action on a chase in which our main character is chasing um, this amazing looking guy who he's out to get rid of because that's his job to get rid of him. They are stuck at one point, literally next to each other and they have a minute in which the guy who's about to be a victim says, listen, my life is important and this is why it is important. This is what I have seen in my existence. And there's like a four minute piece of dialogue there that he gives. And it's almost entirely monologue, one person saying it. So we've had, let's say, five pages before that of all agent and chasing, right? So all this action and chasing we up for the four minutes of dialogue and then there's action again. Those nine pages or those um, five pages represent nine, nine pages of the script. And everybody who's got that script, whether it's the director, set director, whatever, knows that's what that represents. So it's very important that there is some sort of a rhythm that you set up. And um, a good screenplay is a screenplay that sets up wonderful rhythms. 
there were times that I was working, um, when I went back out to Hollywood in the 1980s, I was working with uh, the director, Frank Perry. We were writing and rewriting and adapting um, movies together. And he was used to working with his wife, Eleanor Perry. They had done maybe 15 movies before that, 10 or 15 movies before that. Uh, they had won Academy Awards for some of the movies. She had, they had then uh, separated in life and in work. And she went ahead and started working um, on her own with other directors. She wrote Apocalypse Now. Um, she was involved in uh, the second Godfather script. And um, he was on his own, but was used to working with someone. So he and I were working together. And in some cases, we were right in his office in Beverly Hills, and we would write a script, four or five pages of a script, and then act it out. And this meant that at times we would be really chasing each other around the room, uh, hiding behind furniture, saying the lines from the scripts that we had in hand, um, and working out the rhythm of what was right in each one. And he always knew what the rhythm was that he wanted because he knew the rhythms that he filmed best. <clears throat> so uh, that's something to keep in mind. You may have your own rhythm and once um, you have a, a screenplay that's accepted and it has not um, gone through rewriting, many of them go through rewriting, uh, all kinds of rewriting. Um, one of the reasons why it will go through rewriting, and you'll discover this only later, is because you and the director or you and the main actor who may be also the producer um, have to get, get all of your rhythms in sync together. Last words, and then I'm going to open it up because there's a lot of information here, um, and I I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. Um, Hollywood isn't just a place of glamour, it's a working place and all over the world now, which is something you're aware of. Okay. Hi, Felice. Thank you Hi. so much. Hi. Thank you so much for such an informative and fun presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shamitria, a librarian with LA County Library, and I'll be taking us through this uh, Q&A session. Um, fair warning, we do have a good number of questions, so we'll try our best to get through them, but uh, no promises. If you do send a question, please make sure it goes to the Q&A, or um, if you put it in the chat, make sure it goes to all hosts and panelists. For those of you who do have to leave now, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoy this presentation uh, with Mr. Picano. If you wanna watch the Q&A later, as well as this whole video, uh, visit our YouTube channel at LA County Library. This program was recorded and the video will be uploaded there soon. For the latest news and upcoming virtual and in-person events, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitter at LA County Library. Now let's get started with the questions. The first one that we have is, and this is a two-parter, what can I do as a beginning screenwriter to practice or prepare for future jobs? What can I do to prepare myself for what that type of occupation could look like? Uh, if you want to write, if you really want to write screenplays, write some screenplays. Go and get them out of the library, read five or six of them, watch the movie or TV show or the TV episode and try to do it together um, and try to see where they fit, where they don't fit. It's the type of thing where it's in many ways, it's easier to become a novelist or a poet because we have started reading that very early in our lives, most of us, as uh, compared to reading or watching uh, films um, or stage plays. All of us probably have seen TV from a very early age and that has its own format and there are TV formats to go along with it. Next question. Awesome, thank you. I was just catching everyone else's. We're getting a lot of questions guys, this is great. So, um, 
can a writer start with a treatment before writing the screenplay and or the opposite sequence of these two documents? Absolutely. In fact, um, a really good idea is to write a treatment. Um, start with the log line just to get your basic ideas down on one page and then start writing a treatment. And it can be as long as you want it, but make sure that before you show it to anyone, you will have one page of a log line that will be your cover page and your second and third or four, fourth, sometimes fourth pages will be your treatment. People are not going to read a treatment that's longer than two or three pages. They just don't have the time. Awesome. Thank you. So um, a question just about the script structure, I think. How is the catalyst different from the big event when described in the one to two page summary? Okay. The catalyst in that screenplay that I put two pages up was Byron knocking on the window and as she goes to let him in or to respond to him, a thug appears. That's the catalyst. <clears throat> the big event will happen later on, but that is the catalyst. The cat it's like chem in chemistry, a catalyst is something when you put two things together and you add a third thing, something happens, it fizzes, it explodes, it goes bad, it goes down, it collapses. A cat catalyst is no different than that in a screenplay. The big event will happen later on and it will be substantially different because it will be involved with who these people are and how they are. Whereas the catalyst could be anybody. It can happen to anybody. We don't care who these people are when the catalyst happens. It's happening quickly. Great, thank you. So just in general, there's a question. Any tips on how to overcome writer's block? There is no such thing as writer's block. Write your script or your treatment or your log line as though you're writing it to me and then go onto my website on Google and hit the contact point and send it to me. I will either respond or not respond, depending upon how many of these I get. But the point is, write it to someone, um, and then you have no writer's block, because you already have a reader or a person who's going to read it. Writer's block only happens when you have no ideas and no one to respond to your ideas. Oh, that's so gracious of you. Thank you, Felice. So another question we have is kind of, and I think I'm gonna combine kind of two questions we're getting um, just cause it's asking about the general differences between, you know, um, media. So what's the difference between writing, going from writing a book to writing a script? And then what would be the difference between writing a script for a stage play versus a, a film? Okay, a stage play, nowadays stage plays are in, one or two acts. Generally, they are in two acts um, and they are similar to that eight page or eight part um, screenplay in that the first act or the first four parts ends with a big turnaround, a big surprise, a big shock. Very much true in the theater. It does turn around all of the action and when it leaves people going outside, to drink their coffee or have a martini or eat some peanut butter. Um, and they said, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. I've got to see what happens. I'm going back for act two. So that's how a stage play works. Um, writing it is only a, a sense of, can you see people on a stage doing all of the action? Stage mechanisms have gotten so fabulous in the last 20 years that you can do remarkable things with them. Um, so if you can do it as a stage play, try it, see what happens. Um, one thing you want to do in a movie is make sure that it is a moving picture, that every moment or a series of moments in your uh, script or in your treatment are moving pictures, that they actually move, they go in one direction. 
that two pager that I put on the screen, we had someone going into action immediately and doing a series of actions within two minutes. So it's always got to be moving. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know that was a very complicated question. So thank you for that. Um, another question we have, does the eight part structure apply to individual episodes of a series or drama? So, you know, um, sequential television, basically. Nowadays, they actually do. Um, if it's, a, a, there is always a pilot and the pilot is always a two hour movie. So if not longer, um, The Crown was a two hour movie. Uh, Game of Thrones was a two hour movie. Just all of them are, and they all, all of them will be. Um, so you have to begin with that format um, and keep that in mind all the time. Um, will your second hour um, be, can you write two hours as one and make them be two episodes? Yes, you can do that if you get the second hour to hang up in such a way that everybody wants to get into the next hour. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question um, we have is, you know, a lot of questions we're getting are like people are getting started and they're asking about resources. Um, and I was actually curious myself, are there any books, are there any um, anything that you would recommend to help people kind of get started and ways to organize their thoughts? Like, is there anything that you would specifically recommend? My own branch of the LA uh, County Library has an, which is West Hollywood, has an entire row of books about writing screenplays um, and uh, television movies. Um, and also they have uh, sample scripts they have large, you know, coffee table books on movies, um, what they look like photographically. Some of them are almost page by page. Um, there's enormous resources. Um, and because all of the libraries in the county system are connected, you can go online and order books that may not be in your particular library that look interesting. Some people go into what's called uh, once they have developed scripts and they're trying to get them um, looked at, they go into what's called a boot camp, which is a live four day or three day or five day uh, series of sessions where people do nothing but write scripts. I'm too lazy and too indulgent to do anything like that. <laughs> but if, if you really need a structure like that, by all means, try it out um, and let me know what happened. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Felice. So another question um, with regards to writing a script. One, are there any like ideal places to pitch your script? And then two, how, and this is combining several questions that we're getting to this effect. What would you do in terms of trying to protect your copyright and your idea and to make sure that, you know, when you do submit it, or when you do pitch it, it stays something that's under your control. Okay, everyone write this down right now. Writers Guild of America. The Writers Guild of America is what you will join as soon as your first script or TV episode has been purchased or has been optioned and they're about to do something with it. It is automatic, you have to join it. Uh, in order to get your thing done. You want to join it because they are extremely protective. Before you join it, you can go to them or go online to the Writers Guild of America.org and you can um, have your scenario, your log line, your treatment or your script protected there by them, they do a, uh, in effect, what is a pre-copyright copyright, and they will then give you a number, which will say WGA so-and-so, so-and-so. If you um, can look at my, that script I showed you on the very top left-hand side, it's a WGA, and there were seven numbers. It had been protected by the Writers Guild of America. 
They are con they control the contracts you have, which can get very, very complicated and involved. So that much I can tell you what to do about getting agents and about getting um, scripts done. There's a variety of things that you can do and you should look into various books and magazines about that. Thank you. That's so um, another question um, is we have um, an attendee who has an inclination to write comedy and they're coming up with several ideas for comedy movies and they're asking, would it be better to take a course on comedy writing or on screenwriting? Should either course be taken online or at a college? Do you have a recommendation? And I know you kind of answered a little bit, but this is specifically about comedy writing. Right. Um, comedy writing is still television episode writing, or which is, you know, 47 minutes to the hour, unless it is no commercials, in which case it's about 54 minutes. Um, so there's that specific format and time. And that breaks down if you're doing commercial television in a certain way. Um, but if you're doing uh, movie company writing, it's a standard um, TV uh, movie script. Uh, how is it different? You have to be funny. There, what I talked about before about rhythm is very, very specific for comedy writing. I don't know if there are any particular courses. There are probably books on comedy writing um, or online courses. I would take a look at them and see, go to Yelp and see what people thought about taking that course. Because um, it might be that you're spending your money when you don't have to. There's something everybody does. When a film um, has, the script has been approved, it's ready um, for TV or, or a movie, there's something called the table read. That means that some of the actors, maybe not all of them, but some of the actors, the directors, sometimes the producers, often the writers or screenwriters will all sit down in a room and everybody will read the script. It takes place sometimes over four hours, sometimes over three hours, sometimes in two parts. At that point, the rhythm is determined. People figure out whether the, the, it's going or not. In that case, uh, there is always a table read uh, taking place um, for comedy. Um, in shows like Saturday Night Live, uh, you are hired, you put in uh, the, the um, funny things that you have, five pages of jokes, four pages of stories, just send them in, um, make sure that Writers Guild of America has seen them and that you've got them uh, registered there. Send them in with the registration number and if they're interested, they'll contact you. They're always looking for uh, comedy people. Next question. Great. Um, here's a question uh, we have. Can you pitch film ideas without a completed screenplay, just an outline? Yes, yes you can. And often people do. And sometimes people have done it and regretted it. <laughs> And, and sometimes people have done it and have been very happy to do it and have been very happy to do it. Um, I've never put myself in that position after my first incredibly humiliating position, um, but other people have, and they will um, tell you stories about how uh, somebody uh, actually bought their script on a treatment and four pages. <laughs> Um, a lot of times, if there is somebody connected to the script, this is something you should know if you're getting involved in the business, they will say, here's my script. Do you have anyone connected to it? Anyone connected to it could be a film director. It could be a producer who's willing to back it. It could be somebody who has produced stuff in the past. Um, and is willing to look at it again, it could be an actor or actress. When I've done this course live, people walk in the room and say, can you give my script to Denzel Washington? <laughs> and I say, I don't know Denzel Washington. Flattering though. 
flattering. You know? that they- <laughs> but I mean, it's but that would be a connection if you knew Denzel Washington or your aunt knew him or your barber knew him and can get your script to him. That's your connection. Get the script to him. <laughs> Next Great. question. Thank you. So um, kind of in this line, you know, you said either or sometimes it's it works out to send the script, you know, not completely finished. Uh, but another question we have is what are some do major do's and don'ts for writing a screenplay, for pitching um, and the whole situation with uh, screen screenwriting? OK, so you should have someone in mind that someone could be an actor, it could be a director, it could be a producer, it could be a streaming service. Um, if you're going to Walt Disney, you're going to have different material than if you're going to Showtime or HBO. You're going to be having family-friendly material, what they call family-friendly, because that's what Disney does. You don't want to have on-screen rapes during <laughs> during your script, right? Mm -hmm. HBO, they don't care, right? They're okay with it. You don't want to have people in spaceships shooting each other in a HBO, or unless they specifically are looking for sci-fi stuff. On the other hand, the sci-fi channel is always looking for that. So have someone in mind, even if it's in a very general idea. Um, so have, an, have a, a goal, like your character in your script, you're always moving toward or away from something. In this case, move toward Disney if you have a Disney kind of script. Move toward sci-fi if you have a sci-fi type of script. Write it, keep writing it, keep thinking about it with those people in mind. It may go somewhere else and you never know, but at least you have a shot there. Great, thank you. So um, a couple of questions we've had are asking about, uh, I, I suppose it's screenwriting uh, software programs like Final uh, Draft. Um, in your opinion, are they worth the investment? Is it something needed in terms of being able to like format your uh, screenplay? Final Draft is expensive. And if you have screenwriting friends or friends who are involved in uh, stage writing, <clears throat> buy it together. It is really, really useful. I, can, I mean, you can do other things. You can go online and get um, um, formats, for, especially for stage plays. Sometimes you can even get really good um, TV episode ones. Um, so it's not 100% useful. But to have a final uh, draft script that you have done, worked on it from the beginning, means that when you're doing draft number 13 and you have to go into page 74 and change it, everything else will be changed automatically in your script on final draft. If you're putting in five new lines, the whole thing will line up automatically, which may not happen with any other type of formatting, right? Or if you're taking out two pages, it will line up automatically on final draft. That's one of the ways in which it works in a wonderful manner and why so many professionals use it. Um, as I said before, it is expensive, but I have final draft number five from what, 20 years ago. I still use that one. We can use it forever. There may be bells and whistles in the new ones, but I use the old one. So it's a good investment. Awesome. Thank you. So um, we are getting to the end of our time. So I'm going to ask a few more uh, technical questions and then um, we'll wrap it up. Uh, difference between format or structure is the question. Well, format is basically what the script actually looks like. When we actually got to what the script was, where we could see all the action, everything, that's the formatting. The structure is before that. The structure is what you begin thinking about as soon as you have written a log line page that you are happy with. Once you have that log line page, then you start breaking it down 
into a eight part structure or just start writing it as a treatment and then try to see if you can fit this fit it to the structure at the best or at the worst make sure that it is at least divided into two parts that is very very important there has to be it's a stage play or a screenplay there has to be a stop in the middle in which everything turns around or develops in a new direction or an unexpected direction that is very important. If you can do that, then look at that first part, see if you can divide it again. If you can divide it again with the catalyst and then the big event, after the big event, you have part two. You have part one, part two, I mean, you just move right ahead. So uh, formatting is the actual script itself, the structure is what you're doing before that in your treatment after your log line. Great, thank you. So we'll go for one more question. Um, this again has been asked by a few, um, a few attendees. What would you say is the best genre to break into Hollywood if you're a new writer or as someone put it, like what topics or genres are hot right now? What are studios looking for in your opinion? Well, what studios are looking for and what you like are two different things often. And you really want to be certain that if you want to do screenwriting or TV writing and you only watch horror movies that you're not going to start writing a comedy no matter if even if all the comedies in the world are hot uh, you have to think about people who have started their careers like m night Shyamalan writes a type of horror thriller supernatural movie that nobody else writes when you look at a movie like get out or nope Jordan Peele is writing a type of movie that nobody else in the world is writing. But you can be sure he wasn't watching Disney when he was thinking of writing movies. He was watching the movies that he liked that were supernatural, that were horror, that were thrillers, that were really grab your guts types of movies. So before you decide what the uh, business is looking for, because Keep in mind that changes and it changes in a way that is completely unpredictable. So keep in mind while they're looking for certain things, you have to be online with what you're doing. If you manage to sell a treatment and somebody else writes the screenplay, if you manage to sell a screenplay, keep in mind it is a two to four year process before that film is going to hit the TV screen or the big screen. So what happens yesterday uh, on Showtime or on HBO is not going to be happening four years from now. It is in many ways better to do something original that you would really love doing and that you think you can make a, yourself a name in than to follow everybody else. <clears throat> So that's my suggestion in that. You can watch all the movies you want. You can watch all the TV you want and see what's currently hot. But if that doesn't get to somebody for two years, all of that might have changed by then. Awesome. Thank you. Well, what you love. Yeah. Write what you love. That is a great, that's great parting advice. Thank you so much, Felice. Well, thank you everyone for being here. That's all the time we have for questions. This concludes our program. Thank you to Mr. Picano for joining us and thank you for attending our program this evening. If you want more information about our other virtual programs, visit our library website at lacountylibrary.org. For the latest library news and events, please follow us on social media. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye for now.